This is an excerpt from an article from MysteriousUniverse.org entitled Mysterious and Frightening Real Cases of Demonic Possession by Brent Swanser. There has long been the belief across cultures that beyond the fringes of our known physical reality, lurking on the periphery of our vision and what we think we know, are enigmatic evil spirits, demons, and assorted spectral things beyond our comprehension wallowing in the dark. As scary and creepy as this idea may be, there is also the persistent belief that these apparitions on occasion push forth past the veil that separates our domains to invade not only our reality but also our bodies, for whatever in inscrutable reasons or agendas, they seem to covet our flesh forms and wish to penetrate within us and take control, dominate us, and own us. From beyond the wall that separates us from the world of demons, they creep, and there at times seems to be very little we can do but try and fight them and the unknown powers they possess. Cases of demonic possession and our efforts to fight these sinister beings are numerous, coming from all over the world, and here I have put together a list of some of the creepier and well-known of these. Let us take a look into the bizarre, frightening world of allegedly real demonic possessions. George Lukens In the late 1700s, locals of the village of Yatin, around 20 miles from Bristol in England, were rather alarmed when a man by the name of George Lukens began to display increasingly bizarre behavior. He would spontaneously start snarling like an animal or barking like a dog, as well as sing hymns backwards, sing or chant in a foreign language that the illiterate man did not know, speak in both the voice of a man and a woman, or blurt out vulgar obscenities or profanity for no apparent reason. During these fits, he was also said to often convulse, walk around on all fours, or appear to be thrown about by unseen hands. It was all very uncharacteristic behavior for the young man, who villagers had known to have always been well behaved, calm, and cheerful. These weird episodes were completely unpredictable, could last for up to an hour, and plagued Lukens for years, forcing his family to have him put in a mental institution for 20 months, where all efforts to treat him, or indeed find any cause for condition, failed. Indeed, these episodes became even more intense and tinged with the paranormal as time went on. Lukens would have violent outbursts where he would claw or bite at people or smash items with strength far beyond what his slight figure would suggest, as well as speak in voices that were not his own, and also showed a profound aversion to religious symbols, objects, or words. Spooked villagers began to suspect Lukens was under the influence of demonic forces or witchcraft, and even he himself began to proclaim to anyone one who would listen that he was possessed by seven distinct demons that would require seven priests to eject from him. One minister by the name of Joanne Valton, who had long known Lukens, said of him at the time, quote, I personally knew him, a youth about 18, short in stature, and meager in aspect. He had frequent fits or paroxysms, and was sometimes affected like the Pythonysis, or rather like the Furies, mentioned often by Herodotus and ancient writers. He was cruelly distorted and uttered foul language, but was often heard to say that he should be delivered if seven ministers should pray with him." End quote. Whatever was tormenting Lukens was obviously taking a toll on his health, as he had wasted away into an emaciated, withered-looking husk of his former self, drained of all vigor, and villagers became extremely worried about him. The story of the odd, seemingly possessed man spread through the village and surrounding areas, finally coming to the attention of an Anglican reverend in Bristol by the name of Joseph Easterbrook, who was the vicar of the town's temple church. When other clergymen of the church were told of the case, most of them agreed to be a possibly genuine demonic possession but refused to get involved, perhaps out of fear. Nevertheless, Easterbrook managed to gather together six ministers from a movement of Protestant Christians called Wesleyanism for the purpose of arranging an exorcism for the demon-plagued Lukens to be held at Temple Church on June 13th, 1788. The whole thing was meant to be a low-key affair that would be kept secret, so this ragtag group of exorcists was no doubt very surprised when hundreds of gawkers arrived out of morbid curiosity fueled by stories on Lukens that had been circulating by both word of mouth and through the local news. According to Easterbrook's own account of the ordeal, the exorcism started with Lukens eerily singing in a high-pitched voice, which soon dropped in timber to a deep, gruff one that ridiculed and berated the ministers present and told them that they would undoubtedly fail. He then started alternating between a man's voice and a woman's voice, spewing out vitriol, blasphemous rants, threats of physical violence, and even at one point jarringly singing 
singing a love song. The demons also made it very clear that they were infuriated that these priests would want to try to exorcise them, and express contempt towards Lucan's foretelling them of their evil presence within him. As this tirade went on, other distinct voices began popping through, chattering about different things, singing, barking, growling, babbling about utter nonsense, and one particularly bass voice bragging about his vast powers. Sometimes the voices spoke perfect Latin, which Lucan's had had absolutely no knowledge of, surprising one skeptical observer who was trained in Latin and convincing him that perhaps what he was seeing was all real. Lucan's also sang out a hymn of praise called a Te Deum, to the devil, proclaiming him the supreme leader and governor of all things. The haunted man became so unruly that it required two men to hold him down as the ministers said their prayers over his writhing, contorting body. When asked why they were torturing Lucans, one of the demons allegedly replied, quote, So that I may show my power among men. End quote. After two hours of intense prayer and constant physical restraint, Lucans then became calm, praised God, and stated that the evil presences were gone. In the aftermath of the intense exorcism, controversy stormed around the event and Lucan's veracity. While those who had been present were convinced that this had been a genuine demonic possession, and many upstanding citizens of the village also tended to agree, others were not so sure. There were those who criticized the truthfulness of Lucan's, claiming that he was well known as a clever ventriloquist and skilled mimic, as well as an alcoholic and a prankster. Others said that Lucan's merely suffered from some form of epilepsy, which had been exaggerated by the clergy to seem more supernatural, or that the demonic possession part was wholly fabricated by Lucans to avoid having to work. Even some other clergy criticized the exorcism itself, accusing the Wesleyan ministers of not having been properly ordained to engage in such battles. All things told, the Lucan's exorcism turned out to be one of the most hotly debated and controversial exorcisms the country had ever seen. For his part, Lucan's experienced no further incidents of demonic possession, and returned to a quiet, humble life. Although he wanted to stay in Bristol, he eventually returned home to Yatin due to negative public reaction to him living there in the wake of the exorcism. He would go on to live a rather poor life with only sporadic employment as a bookseller and bill sticker, and living mostly off of begging and government aid until he died a lonely man in 1805.